Hey, what's going on everybody? Welcome back. This video, we're going to be talking about the for loop. Once you got the for loop down, taking on the while loop and the do while loop is a super piece of cake, so no worries at all. This is going to be fun. Once you got loops down, you can start making some really cool applications, so I'm pretty excited, and I hope you are as well. But you know what I get really excited about? That's right, our sponsor, Embarcadero Rad Studio. Rad Studio is the IDE of choice for C++ development. Quickly build native, mobile, and desktop applications from a single C++ code base and deploy to Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android. With Rad Studio, user interface design has been made easy with hundreds of pre-built components for cross-platform development. You can easily integrate with popular source control management systems, databases, APIs, and you can make your life easier with numerous third-party extensions. Let Rad Studio do the heavy lifting when it comes to C++ development. Give it a go with a free trial by following the link in the description. So now let's get back to loops, and what we're going to do is we're just going to go through some simple for loop examples. So let me zoom in just a little bit for you guys. What we're going to do is we're just going to say four, get that structure built, and we're just going to count to 10. So we're going to do the basic loop. Int i equals zero, i is less than 10, i plus plus. And in here, we're just going to output i. Like so, right there. And we're going to compile and run. And you can see it gives us an output from zero all the way up to nine. Now, if this syntax is completely new to you and you didn't watch the previous video, I highly recommend you go check that out because that's going to give you all of the background on how loops work. Basically, there is an initialization, a comparison, and then an update. And that's how we progress through the loop. You can use this variable inside of the loop to basically tell us where we are in the loop. So for example, on the first iteration, we have the value zero, the second iteration, we have the value one, and so forth. Now, if you wanted to shift these up one because it starts at zero and you wanted to say, let's say one through 10 instead of zero through nine, it's very easy. All you have to do is say i is equal to one, i is less than 11, like so. Now, when we output this, it's going to start at one, but it's going to count all the way up to 10. So the end result is that we still get 10 iterations, but now the i value starts at one and goes to 10. More often than not, you're probably going to see this start at zero, and this is gonna be one less. That's because a lot of the things we're gonna be using inside of programming, such as arrays, are zero-based, meaning the first element has the index zero. And we'll be getting into how to iterate through arrays and all that stuff here pretty soon. But for now, just know that we're often going to see this start at zero. Another thing I wanted to mention is that this condition could be basically anything. So for example, I could say less than or equal to 10. In that situation, it's actually going to iterate 11 times, printing out 10 as its last value. So now it's going from zero to 10. So should you use less than or should you use less than or equal to? Well, it's ultimately up to you, but as a personal preference and what I think is most common in the industry is to try to stick to less than. If you keep it consistent, it's pretty easy to figure out how many iterations you're going to get. For example, if you start at zero and go less than some value, whatever this value is, that's how many iterations there's going to be. So in this situation, there's going to be 10 iterations from zero to nine. Now you could also count down. So for example, we could say i is equal to nine, and let's just go from nine to zero. So let's say as, as long as this is greater than or equal to zero. And what we're going to do is we're going to decrement i. Make sure you decrement, because if you increment, we're gonna have an infinite loop. And just to show you guys that, let's do it. <laughs> when we run this, you can see it just counts forever. The way to get out of this is to hold control and press C, <laughs> but you can also just see how long it will run before your computer explodes. That would be cool too. So we're gonna make sure we decrement, and now we should get a countdown. There we go, it goes from nine all the way down to zero. So you can see that you can customize these loops to do a whole lot of different things. We counted up to nine, we counted down from nine, and we can even make some more complex stuff. So for example, let's say I wanted to do something similar to this to calculate a, what's it called, factorial. So if a factorial of a number is like, if you have a factorial of five, it's going to be five times four times three times two times one. So let's go through an example of that. So what we can do is we can start with some number what we're trying to calculate the factorial of, and we'll say we're trying to calculate the factorial of five. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna start i at one less than that. So we'll just say factorial minus one, 
And as long as this is greater than or equal to, we'll just say greater than zero. So we don't want to hit zero, we want to stop before zero when, we have, when we're at one. <laughs> and then we're going to decrement. Now what we're going to do is we're basically just going to store the new total in this factorial here. So what we could do is we could say factorial, multiplied equals, and if it's easier to see, you could just say factorial multiplied by i. So at first this is going to be five times four, and then that new value 20, it'll be 20 times three, which will be 60, so then 60 times two, 120, and then 120 times one. That last one doesn't actually change the value, so you could say greater than one here even. Now let's compile and see if we get that output, but we definitely wanna make sure we output it at the end. So we'll say factorial, and then we'll output that value, and then we'll do an end line, so like so, right there. Compile, run, and you can see factorial is 120. Now if you wanted to keep that original variable, you could. So for example, we could say int fact and set that equal to five, and then assign that to factorial. And now we're going to have a reference to that original value, so what we could do is say factorial of, and then I'll put the original value by saying fact, and then inside of quotes, we could put this to the uh, colon there. Now let's compile and run. Factorial of five is 120. So maybe you're looking at this and you're like, what the heck is going on? Or maybe you're like, wow, dude, this is super easy. Why are you wasting my time? <laughs> Honestly, there's going to be a spectrum of people watching this video, so it's hard to say where you are in that spectrum. But wherever you are, you can easily see that using these loops allows us to build more complex applications, something that would be much more difficult to do without loops. Doing something like this without a loop, yeah, good luck. <laughs> Let me know how to do that and make sure it's, it's able to do with any value. So let's say we can throw in a seven in here and get another value. We're basically able to generalize our program and use any value as an input. That's what loops are for. That's why they're useful. If this is too hard, don't worry about it. You don't have to know how to calculate a factorial right now. If it's too easy, that's great. Go find a harder loop and try to understand it. <laughs> the point of this video is not to show you guys how to do a factorial. It's how to use loops and how to see their value. So thank you guys for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe so I can take over the internet. Really appreciate it. And of course, I'll see you in the next video.